everyone. Um, I am here with Maureen and Joan and Helen and Ginger. Yeah, I can't, it won't let me show you guys, but um, we're going to walk through the DNA for you right now. Um, so you, maybe you can just look on hers. I'm going to bring up my DNA here somewhere. I don't know how much you actually do know about this yet, but this is just fitness and nutrition DNA. So this isn't, you know, like trying to find your family tree or anything like that. But mm -hmm. this is, this is ultimately like the day we were born, this was our DNA. It will always be our DNA. But what's really, what's really important is that um, people understand that if we knew this when we were born and we followed this, we probably wouldn't have half the health issues that we have, or we wouldn't have weight issues that we have. We kind of epigenetically, we kind of created those problems by deviating from what our genetics is saying ultimately is the best way for us to live. Mm -hmm. So epigenetics is what we do, how our lifestyle and how we do things can change. Um, I mean, our DNA is our DNA, but how it, how do you want to say it? How Express. it triggers or expresses or how it works depends on what we do. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's including sleep, diet, our chemical uh, exposure, our toxic stress, yeah. exposure, um, you know, the smoke, alcohol, what, you know, all mm -hmm. of those things, those are our epigenetics. They influence the way our body works. So they therefore influences the way our genetics express themselves. So learning what it is or how it should be is half the, half the battle. Mm -hmm. The other half is to get kind of back to where you were before so that you can start, you know, fresh. But if you don't know what you're trying to shoot for, you can't, you can't get there, right? And that's like where our cell detox comes in handy because we, we work people through all of the different components of bringing you back closer to a balanced state of well-being mm -hmm. so that your genetics have a better chance to either express themselves or knowing how to suppress a, maybe a bad genetic mm -hmm. coding, you know? So, um, so before we actually dive in and kind of walk through it, I just want to say that, so some people can just buy a DNA kit and a couple of products and like get some of these vitamins that they're maybe deficient in and they'll do really well. Maybe they're not really toxic and, the, and they're just going to do really well. And we have a ton of people that do that. They mm -hmm. just buy the DNA. They start taking some vitamins. They follow kind of a nice protocol, uh, eating protocol. Other people that let themselves get to the point where I was, whether it's from a health condition or stress in your life or whatever, I was following it as much as I could, but I, I had gotten to a point where I was pretty toxic mm -hmm. inside. So I needed to kind of, you know, I needed more than that, but either way, this DNA gives people that information. Well, I think the first thing with the DNA is when somebody gets their DNA, you have to make sure that they register their kit. Um, that's really key. And in that inside flap that's in the DNA, I would write there, they're going to create a login and username and password information. Make sure they write it on that and keep it somewhere. I would even take a, have them take a photo of it. So if they misplace that, um, because it is HIPAA um, compliant. So mm -hmm. it's, you can get the information, but it's a little it's just takes time. So just make sure in that inner flap that where it has the barcode and the kit number registration um, right there, um, email, username and password for the ID life. I think it's idlife.molecularlabs.com is where they'll go to register that. Um, so really, and make sure they fill out the, the little cardboard um, uh, kind of information card that goes within the kit um, and make sure they sign it. I've had people not sign it. If they don't sign it, they are not authorizing the kit to actually be done. <laughs> so um, fill it out to the best of your avail availability. A lot of people, they don't see Caucasian on there. They are European descent, most likely, if they are not Hispanic or African-American. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious with everything else. It's the Caucasian where a lot of people are concerned. So they would be European descent. Okay. So I am going to show you mine. Um, everyone here at the table has, uh, you guys are looking at my DNA, the first one there, and then Joan and Maureen have theirs. 
or somebody else's, yours, right? Um, so I'm just going to walk through each different thing um, as it would be depending on how they are expressing their genes, um, how their genes are, and we're going to talk about what it means. So um, we're going to scoot down here to the page where it says muscle performance. These earlier pages, so you guys are going to flip because that's the, just a quick breakdown. The first couple of sheets where you see the... Um, back up here like all of this this is just a quick synopsis of everything that's in the booklet so we're going to go back down i think it's page 11 i believe and we're going to go to muscle performance so we're going to just be on straight on muscle performance and for me go back one more helen come back no it's page nine or eleven nine page nine. So muscle performance is where your genes express themselves as far as I'll say muscles, the way that your muscles twitch. So let's talk about, let's start with mine. I'm, you can see I am in endurance. I am on that right side in the green, um, which means I have a majority. It doesn't mean I only have, but I have a majority of slow twitch muscle response, which means it takes longer for my muscles to actually activate and break down so for instance, you know, if you look at some of the examples, you know, the endurance athlete might be that triathlon person, the um, marathon runner, the long distance biker, that type of stuff. For me, that was a shock. Like I thought I was speed and power. I mean, I'm built like a speed and power more than I am an endurance athlete. However, my muscles, the way they break down in tone is all about kind of that longer extended workout time. So it just takes me longer. So for me, if I, if, if you or somebody you're, you're going over their DNA with is an endurance that athlete, I'm going to talk to you about what type of exercises you, they will want to do as far as more of an aerobic workout and also a weight workout. So as far as the aerobic, we're talking hiking, biking, um, that long distance, and I guess swimming, I should probably look and see what they say. The examples here aren't always, yeah. So the examples I give are the cycling, the mountain climbing, cross country. It's that long extended workout. Um, it just takes longer to break down that muscle. So you're gonna have to look at doing things that take more time. This is, unfortunately, the endurance athlete is somebody who does not quickly get out of the gym. Like it just takes us longer weightlifting. So this is where people get confused because they're like, so what do I do when I'm lifting weights? Well, we know, we know that lifting weights is great um, because as we age, we want to maintain muscle integrity. And one of the ways to do that is to actually lift weights. So if you find yourself like me, and if you look down here in the yellow or in the orange, 14.9 of the population is an endurance athlete. So I'm less of 15% of the population that has a majority of slow twitch muscle response. So there's not as many of us as there are sprinter or the combination. So it, there isn't a lot of information out there. Like there are, you know, just speed and power is kind of the usual way people work out, but for an endurance athlete, when it comes to lifting weights, here's what you're going to want to do. So depending where you're at, if you're kind of a beginner, um, or you don't really like to work out or lift weights that much, you're going to want to do two to three sets. Um, I'm just going to use the example for, uh, of two sets. Um, and then the third set could just, just be another layer, but you're going to do two sets and you're going to build your um, workouts around maybe eight to 10 exercises. Um, most of them are going to be upper body. Um, I'll talk about lower body. Um, it's not as necessary as per se, the upper body, the shoulders, the arms, the under the arms, um, kind of that breast muscle, um, just because it's, it's very different when it comes to actually lifting the physical weight. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to pick a weight, um, depending on the exercise you do, and it's going to be different for every, every exercise, because if you're doing a bicep curl, you can 
every single person's going to be able to do a heavier weight on a bicep curl than they are say a butterfly or a bench press just because of the the muscles we use our biceps all the time they're just naturally stronger this underarm is weaker we don't use that as much so you want to fatigue that muscle if you're doing 12 to 15 reps in that first set by the time you get to 12 13 or 14, 15 for sure, you want to barely be able to lift that weight. That's how heavy it has to be. So let's say you pick four upper body exercises to do um, twice a week, and then you do another three or four upper body exercises two other days of the week. So you're kind of going to give your, your certain muscle groups a break. So let's say you're going to do bicep curls. You're going to do butterflies. You're going to do overhead and maybe, um, upright rows. So you're going to, those are going to be the first four exercises. Say you might choose, and you can always do a YouTube search on different upper body exercises. If you, um, kind of don't know where to start. Um, and maybe you just pick those four and you do that twice a week and you just start there. Um, but you want to work different areas. Like you don't want to do everything that activates just the arms. You want to engage that back. You want to engage um, the, the bicep and the tricep. So you're going to do one, your first set, you're going to do the first exercise. You want to fatigue at 12 to 15 reps. You're going to do the next exercise and pick that weight that will fatigue at 12 to 15 reps and the third and the fourth, the same thing. Then just shake it all off. Take a, take a little bit of a couple of minutes to get some water, take a break, then go back and do it again. And depending how that first set went. So if that first set, you were very close to being fatigued, keep with that same weight. If it was super easy for you, go up a weight, go up maybe two pounds or five pounds. But by the time maybe you get to 12 on that second set, you are barely able to lift it like you're struggling. Don't get to the point where you injure yourself, but it should be really difficult. Like I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And if you're at that 12 rep at that point, that is a perfect place to end. Okay. So endurance athletes, it just takes you longer. If you don't fatigue that muscle to that point with two sets, that's where your third set can come in handy and maybe use the same rep because you probably will fatigue by then. Remember it takes longer. All right. Speed and power. Speed and power is what most people, it's very common ways to work out. We're talking about um, aerobically. Hit exercises are great. Boot camps, boxing. Um, it, it's funny. Um, the examples I get, I don't know anybody who hurdles. Most people aren't doing gymnastics, <laughs> Olympic lifting. So it's kind of funny. Um, so I'm going to give you some more usable exercises for power and speed. Um, doing burpees. If you can handle doing burpees, not everybody can. If knees are bad, shoulders are bad, but burpees doing sets of 10 burpees, maybe you do 12 in a row, then you do 10 in a row, and then you do eight in a row, you know, and you just kind of break. That's a great um, power and speed. Um, and it kind of does muscle and um, gets the aerobic um, potential up as well. Um, another um, thing, you're kind of stopping and starting. So even just throwing jabs and doing um, jumping jacks and just kind of mixing it up. HIT, H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training is fabulous for speed and power. It's also good for endurance too. We'll talk about that in a little bit to see if that, that could be a good, um, I think it's good for everybody to get your VO2 max going and get that up. But for speed and power, it's really good. So if you do boot camps, if you do kickboxing, those are great things to do, but you can mimic those things. Um, really just doing a YouTube search for hit exercises and doing those a couple times a week would be really beneficial to get the aerobic part. So for lifting on speed and power, what you're going to do, if it, um, what you're going to do is you want to fatigue that muscle where at the endurance side, you want it to go 12 to 15 reps. It's the opposite on speed and power. You want to fatigue that muscle in about five to six reps. So what you're going to do where endurance, you're lifting heavier and slower speed and power, I'm sorry, lighter endurance. You're lifting a little lighter, which I probably didn't say, but you're lifting heavy enough to fatigue that muscle at 12 to 15 reps. 
at speed and power, you want to fatigue that muscle at five to six reps. So you're lifting really heavy because you're only doing five or six of those reps. So you want to lift as heavy as you can to fatigue that muscle in five to six reps, but you're going, you can lift a little faster. So in endurance, you might be counting to four on the way up four on the way down speed and power. It might be one, two, one, two, but it's super heavy. So you can do the same thing you would do in endurance, pick maybe four exercises for upper body and do those all four the way that we discussed and then take a break and then repeat the second set. And again, you should fatigue that muscle at five to six, like really at five you should barely be able to lift that weight for one more set. And the sixth one, maybe you even get it halfway there and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, my muscles are jelly. That's how you should feel. All right. So if you're a mixed, if you're a combination, which again, this is 45, this is the most popular is most people have a combination where speed and power, if I didn't mention, that's your fast switch. They, your majority of your muscle fibers really fatigue fast. So we need to hit it fast and furious. That's the speed and power component where endurance, it's just slow to break down that muscle fiber. In the middle, you have a combination of both as a mixed um, um, person here with your genetics, you have to activate both of them. So it is mixing them up. You can mix it up. So you might do for weights, you might do one set the speed and power, let's activate those fast switch muscle fibers first. So let's hit it really heavy on that first set. And then on the second set, maybe you're going much um, slower and heavier to activate the slow twitch muscles response later. or later. And so I would say um, if you're in the, if you're a mixed person, you might even want to focus on doing three sets of, you know, maybe that fast twitch, if you activate and your muscles are fatigued with during that first set, when you come back and you do your endurance, that slow twist muscle, muscle fiber, what you want to do is go heavy enough to fatigue at 12 to 15. And then your second set, you're still doing more fatiguing at 12 to 15. So that third set, just to really break down that slow twitch, because it's how your when your muscle fibers break down, that's when you heal and begin and rejuvenate and rebuild muscle. So we have to activate both of those um, fiber groups when you're a mixed. So I hope that makes sense. If not, you know, reach out to me and we will answer the questions. Well, another part of that too, is a lot of people like go to the gym and they spend, you know, an hour on the treadmill and they're not, that's not what's good for them. So they, unless you're an endurance athlete, unless you're an endurance athlete, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. And they just run and run and run and run on that treadmill or walk, they walk and walk and walk and walk. And that's great for endurance, but you might just be able to go in and, and hop, hop on the treadmill for 20 minutes and then walk, run, go, walk, go, run, go do some hit stuff or whatever. So I know Helen, you're, you're speed and power. You're mixed. I'm mixed. mixed in your endurance. So that's just four people at one table and only two of us are the same. And that's the 45% club. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we, luckily we need a combination. Like, I don't know about you. I know you like to lift, mm -hmm. but I like to do both. Mm -hmm. I like to do both. I like to do some cardio and sometimes I just want to, I got the raw deal. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. got to work out for a long time. And, you know, it seems it's weird because it's like, it's it, we're going to find out that next but it's like some of this might not really be that big of a deal to some people but some people cannot lose weight with just dieting and some people cannot just lose weight with exercise yeah. i always tried to out exercise a bad diet so i did mm -hmm. do a lot of exercise but i will tell you that by just mistake i didn't do this intentionally but i loved to do the jillian michaels I don't get a plug for this, but the Jillian Michaels 30 day shred. And that was a combination of cardio and weights. Yep. And it was, you know, get in, get it done 20 minutes. That was when I was in the best shape of my life. I didn't know why nothing else ever worked, but I'd either focus on weightlifting or I would just spend hours on the treadmill. I need both. I'm right in the middle. So when I was doing those like hit exercises as a mi mixed power and uh, speed and power and endurance 
that was the best shape of my life. And what really sucks is she has always been on a really good diet, hates exercising, and she got stuck with endurance, which means she's got to work out longer and harder. Yeah. In our next slide, you'll see even more. So for me, and I hate, I hate, like, I'm not a great dieting person. So then I find out that <laughs> I need exercise or I need diet, diet. to lose weight. So, so it, it is, it one. is a kind of important. So, you know, like Maureen said, I was doing all speed and power and I was actually gain. I was just a bigger version of me. I wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me. It was actually doing the opposite of what I wanted. I was actually putting on weight, getting bulkier. I was strong, but it wasn't giving me the look that I wanted for sure. All right. So the next one, um, fat loss with exercise. So I'm going to talk about the green and I'm going to talk about the red Then I like to kind of, cause when you have the middle, it's always, you get, it's easier to put it in perspective. So when it comes and I would recommend you do that too, because when people understand both, you know, all sides of this, don't spend a lot of time if they're not in the red or in the green, but I always start out by just basically discussing, I'm going to go in a little bit deeper because if they are red or green, you're going to want to know more things, but it just puts it in perspective when wherever they end up coming in with their genetics. So for most efficient, what this means is it is extremely beneficial over diet. It is really beneficial to exercise. So if you are in the green, you you've got exercise and you've got exercise five, six times a week. I mean, you've got to be doing something. And now we know based on the first slide that we looked at, you now know, where are you? Are you endurance? Are you a mixed or are you speed and power? And using those exercise, that classification to now every day, if you're in the green, like take Sundays off or Saturdays off or something, but you, you need to be doing something every day and it needs to relate back to the last slide. So somebody in diet, diet needs to be in check for everybody. I mean, you can't out exercise a bad diet, like Maureen said, um, but diet is secondary. The, the person, if they want to lose fat and get their body in check long-term, if they're in the green, they have got to exercise. Let's talk about the red. So least efficient. So a lot of people like me, this would have been awesome because I have my diet in check. I've not always, but let's just say the last six, seven years of my life, I've really had my diet in check. However, <laughs> I need to exercise because as you can see here, I'm in the yellow. So for the people in the red, if they over-trained, if they over-exercised, it could actually cause their genetics to react negatively and say, oh, you're overdoing it. We're going to store fat because you're stressing the body out so much to protect you. We're going to store fat because you're causing all this injury. You're causing all this breakdown, all this inflammation. We need to do something about it. So these triggers in your body, this communication that's going on based from your genetics is saying, whoa, horsey, let's time out here. You're overdoing it and you need to back off of the exercise. It doesn't mean you don't move and don't exercise, but what it means is you need to do more low, well, depending what your slide is before, do more of a low impact version of what's in the last slide. So if you're a power, speed and power, you maybe don't be doing boot camps if you're in the red. Maybe you just want to do a lower impact workout. And again, that would be conversations to have with a trainer or just Google or search low impact exercises and take it down a notch. Don't overdo it. So in the yellow, which is me, you're in the yellow, you're in the green. So Joan has to work out mm -hmm. and you're in the yellow. So no, Helen's I'm actually in the, in the green. Oh, Hel Helen's in the green. So I was the over exerciser oh, yeah. all the years and was heavy. Yeah. We joked about, you don't know how hard I work out to stay this fat. <laughs> Did you all hear that? And it was true. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. And that we see a lot in, in our, in our clinics, when we see people and they're telling us they're working out, they're working out, they're working out and they're mm -hmm. overweight. We're like, okay time out. Yeah. And we don't even know their genetics, but because we know this about genetics now, we'll say, you know, you might, you might want to get your DNA tested because here's the, here's the deal is you may have a genetic SNP that is coded for, if you overtrain, you're going to store fat. And 
it will be impossible for you to get to where you want to be. So let's talk the yellow. If you're in the yellow, this is the person, me, I have to have both in check. I have, if I want to lose fat, like I can lose weight, but if I want to lose actual fat and maintain kind of long term weight loss, I have to work out, but I also know I'm endurance. So walking, hiking, which are things I like to do. My problem is the weight. So I need to get in and I need to be doing more weights for my upper body, which I kind of gotten away from, but I was doing, and I was having very good success, but I also need to have my diet in check. One without the other is no good. And honestly, one without the other for any of us is no good, but more importantly for me is I, I really need to have check and balances on both the exercise and the diet, where if you're in the red, it's more about diet focus, low impact exercising. If you're in the green, it's more about exercising maybe five, six times a week and referring back to your last slide on, are you endurance or are you speed power or a mix? Okay. Let's go to the next page. And that goes both ways too. Like the former president of our company used to go to the gym like an hour and a half every morning on the treadmill. And then she found out that, that <laughs> she was, was in the red. Yeah. And so she really just needed to get her diet in check and spend 20 minutes working out three, four times a week. And she was good. Yeah. She, and she's yeah, still she teeny tiny. Yeah, yeah. She's really doing great. Hey, do you know this really quick? The Wi-Fi. Oh, it's on a sheet up there okay. somewhere. Cool. Um, so it's their phone number. Oh, so aerobic potential. So a couple things here. One, this helps gives us um, a little bit of an insight to potential for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, so if you're in the orange or the yellow, that makes you more susceptible to those things. If you're in the greens, that makes you less susceptible. However, it's kind of like, if you don't use it, you can lose it. And, but if you're in the greens, it's like that, that muscle memory philosophy that it doesn't take you long to pick back up. Maybe if you hadn't done like hit exercises or worked out for a while, as long as you stay consistent, you can continually to grow and um, increase that VO2 max, which is basically that's your aerobic capacity. So I always think of like the person running on the treadmill, you know, they're all hooked up and stuff. Um, in people who have the low to the medium, they're sucking wind, you know, they're just, they exhaust, they're exhausted sooner than later. They don't have that lot kind of like that long wind span that we sometimes think about. And then there's others like me. It's like, sometimes I'm just shocked. Like I got little legs and I can out walk and I'm like kicking butt when I'm like going up a hill and everybody else is like, oh. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not even a big workout, but I'm also an endurance athlete. So that's good. But I also have a higher aerobic potential so I can withstand that a little bit longer. So if you're in the, the orange or the yellow, it means you really want to work this aspect of your genetic coding more so than anybody because for health purposes this is really important um so if you're in the orange or the yellow hit exercises the um, high intensity interval training which we talked about in that first slide hit exercises are great for everybody but depending on especially how you come in to uh, this page with the aerobic potential really gives you an idea of where you need to start. So I will tell you just because I come into the green, if I don't activate it and use it, even though I have a really good genetic SNP, if my epigenetics, so this is where um, like Maureen was talking about, we have genetics, genetics are what you're born with. They don't change. What changes is how they express themselves. So based on your stress levels, your diet, your exercise, your toxic and chemical exposures, your sleep, um, do you smoke or, or do you drink too much? Do you, you know, all of that stuff, all of that impacts the way your genetics are going to express themselves. So for example, for aerobic potential here, yes, I am, I'm green. I'm in the higher version of that. If I am really consistent, even just twice a week of doing HIIT exercises, I can easily do HIIT exercises without, like I'm, 
I'm sweating and I'm, I'm fatigued and I'm, I'm working it, but I can make it through a whole workout. However, when I don't do it, like I haven't done much in like the last month, it got dark at it's dark at seven in the morning. So at seven in the morning, I'm not looking to get up where when it was lighter out, I was getting up and working out and I was doing a great job. And then I just kind of got lazy. So I need to shift and I need to get back into it. So I'm probably going to have to start down a little bit, not at an advanced level. So when you look at the bottom of this page here in the blue, it says your personal um, guidance, each depending on where you actually are in the orange, yellow, or greens, your guidance program is going to be a little bit different. So this is mine, um, but there's advanced, intermediate, and beginner. So for some of you, it might just be one exercise or one, you don't have the three levels. You might just have, this is what you do. And then there's some things that you can do to add on to that. Start somewhere. Like for me, I, some people have to do like 28 minutes and it's 45 seconds of like eight different exercises. I think, let's see, where is, where is Helen on this? So Helen, so Helen's low. So yeah, hers is, is mine. oh, so Maureen's lower than Maureen's in the yellow on this page. And she has 28 minutes and she has different exercises than I have. And basically Helen once she, low. oh, this is Helen's, this oh, is what I'm looking at. No, this is That's yours. Oh, okay. Oh, there. Okay. Helen, and Helen is low. Helen is low. Joan is low. So and like I'm in the low. orange, orange is only four workouts for 10 minutes is where you're starting. So really wherever the person comes in on this page, use this as a starting point. If you can't do this, don't go on YouTube and try to find all different types of hit exercises, stick to what comes up and then advance from there. Okay. So, um, I just set, I just take my phone and I set my clock to 45 seconds and I do push-ups for 45 seconds, whatever I do, I do walking lunges. Mine's running in place, tricep dips, body squats. I do each one of those for 45 seconds. Then I take a little bit of a break and then I do another set. And so, um, when I first did this, I just said, well, these are easy. I barely made it through the second set. I was like, oh my God, I'm so out of shape. So start somewhere. Um, if you haven't worked out a lot, start with intermediate intermediate or the beginner um, or just start. But this is a great way to build that VO2 max for health-wise with lung capacity right now. We're all so concerned about you know, that aspect of our health because of everything that's been going on in the last, you know, year and a half. Um, so it's a great way to keep the lungs strong and oxygen throwing through the flowing through the body. Well, and I can tell you personally, Angie lives like, what is it called on the hill? Gibraltar. Yeah. 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 And so like I was working out all the time and she hated to work out and I'd go to her house and she'd say, let's go walk up oh, the, the hill. <laughs> And she'd just be bloop, 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 right up the hill. And I'd be like, yeah. and I'm like, what the heck? Like how, like I work out all the time. How is she doing this? But she's higher yeah. than I am. So she's got a higher. Yeah, but you can build it. Mass. You can absolutely build it. And if you're in the yellow or the orange, you absolutely want to, especially in lieu of our current, you know, situation going on with healthcare respiratory and stuff, respiratory yeah. stuff. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, injury, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on all this stuff. This is pretty common sense, but if you're obviously green, you have lower risk to um, sprain or twist or tear the Achilles tendon. Um, let's just say the Achilles is the largest tendon. So if you have a tendency to have an increased risk to tweak that, sprain that, tear that, you're gonna have more risk for the smaller um, uh, tendons and muscle fibers and stuff like that too. So just, you know, if you're in the red, you don't want to be doing box jumps. You might want to watch, um, jump roping, that kind of stuff where you could easily, you know, I always kind of think like clumsier for some reason, kind of clumsy. <laughs> I'm well, in the high risk. Arch support too, for shoes. 
Yeah, you might. So and it comes to a lot. I've had plantar fasciitis before, and it is not fun. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. we're not even going to talk about yeah. this one because I'm okay. in the high risk, and I wear <laughs> six inch heels, and I've yeah. never injured naughty. any. <laughs> naughty. <laughs> but it just it's just kind of a My it's just kind of a there. notice. You know, it's like. You know, you, you just want to be careful, especially if you're beginning to work out, you want to just, just take it easy. So you don't hurt yourself. And that's true. So recovery. So I'm going to tell you, I'm speaking from experience today because I am so sore. So I have delayed onset muscle soreness. So my daughter's dog wiped me out two days ago. And I thought, I can't believe I'm not sore on Thursday and Friday today my back, my shoulder, everything is killing me. Like I, I, he knocked me downstairs. That's this beautiful dog just about killed me and I'm so sore, but it's so weird that I didn't feel anything for two days, but that is typical for someone with this genetic coding. And I'm the person in the red who I'll work out. I'll, even if I'm gardening, using muscles that I don't typically use, I won't feel it that day. I won't feel it the next day, but I can't get off or on the toilet without like help <laughs> <It's bad. laughs> because I'm so, I'm so sore. So one thing that I do do and do do, it sounds funny when I say that, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing um, I should have done this, I should have done right away um, is I should have had a post-workout because I know when I, um, in, in past history, if I do a ID life post-workout and if there were something better, I would tell you to do it, but I am telling you the post-workout is the, when I go home today, I am having a post-workout. Um, it helps with the inflammatory responses. So if, if you do work out and challenge yourself, it's one thing if you're kind of just lollygagging through your workouts, but if you're really going to take this serious and you haven't really worked out in a while, you're going to be a little sore, have a jar of post-workout. It's great for pre and post surgeries. Uh, it's post-workouts just not about working out. It's about recovering. So more than anything that post-workout, know the difference between soreness and pain. Um, the person in the green, there are people, you know, they could do a killer workout and they're fine. Like they don't even get sore. And if they are sore, they recover super fast. Yellow, just a slower recovery, but the red, yeah. You know, every time I say to somebody, yeah, it's like, you don't feel it for two days. You can't get off the toilet. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's so true. <laughs> so but you do need to kind of work through that. Because yeah. You don't want to, you want to push through it. You don't yeah. want to say, oh, I can't work out now for four or five days because I'm it's easy, sore. It's easy to do that if it, you're really sore, but don't do that workout. Just walk, work another, move, keep, things going. keep moving. Yeah, this box here is helpful too. yeah. And here's one thing you guys, and what you want to tell anyone you're working with is read your report. We're, what we're talking about today is kind of above what's in the report. There is some great information within this report. Today is about helping you maybe better take it to another level and utilizing the information. All right, here's one, carbohydrates and fats we're gonna talk about. So um, if you have a pen and paper, you're definitely gonna wanna write this down. I'm gonna tell you how you can um, figure carbohydrates out. So one of the first things you want to do is you can go and find a BMR calculator online. You can just go to DuckDuckGo as a search engine and type in BMR calculator. That's your basal metabolic, wait, BMR, basal, basal metabolic, metabolic rate. rate. <laughs> Too many acronyms. No, nope, okay. totally different. You don't want okay. BMI, you want BMR. And this is a calculator. It's going to ask you your, I believe your age, your weight, your height, I think that's it. And you're going to enter that and then you'll hit calculate and it'll give you um, calories per day, kind of your, your at rest, what your body is capable of burning without necessarily storing more weight and fat. So what I like to do is whatever that number is, I always like to take it down about 300 calories, unless you're trying to build muscle, you can increase it a little bit. But most of us are always trying to stay in check, maybe lose a few pounds. If you're really comfortable with your weight and you don't have any weight to lose, whatever that number is, that's kind of should be your calories per day that you're shooting for. Not much more, not much less. But if you are wanting to lose weight, our rule of thumb is take two to 300 calories off, uh, off of that number. So if it's 1400, you're going to take it down to 1100. And it depends that like, I'm only four foot 11. So my resting BMR for me to just maintain my weight 
I can't have more than like 1180 yeah. calories. Yeah. Most people go, well, just eat 1200 calories or less and you'll lose weight. I need less than 1200 to maintain yeah. my weight. So it sucks to be short. You barely get to eat, but <laughs> as long as you're exercising, no, okay. <laughs> but BMR is really important because like, I can't drop that down to or 300 because no. that's not healthy. So for her, it'd be like a thousand would yeah. be good for her, which is not too far off of what we we typically you do and right. I'm, I'm at like 1200 so that a good rule of thumb here is so i'm going to talk about green yellow and red as far as um how to do this so what you're going to do is you're going to find out your bmr and then you're going to take if, if you want to lose weight whatever number you're going to go with that's your number so for for instance let's just I should probably have my phone so I can speak. It does ask you activity level. Oh, activity level. Always yeah. put reduced. Yeah, just put that. You're <laughs> so like unless list. you're like yeah. Yeah. doing marathons or yeah. something. Okay. I would put, yeah. So let's just say 1,200 calories is, let's say it came up as um, 1,500 calories or 1,500 calories was your BMR, but you want to lose weight. So 1,500 calories was your BMR, but you want to lose weight. Because most people, the one reason why they're doing the DNA is they want to know how they can better um, mm -hmm. exercise mm -hmm. and diet and all that good stuff. So let's say your BMR came in at 1500, you're going to take 300 off of that and you're going to go with 1200 calories a day. So for someone in the green, for carbohydrates, if you're in the green, you can take that 1200 and you're going to times it by 0 0.50 and that's going to give you 600 that's 600 calories, if you're in the green, towards your total food for the day. So we're talking calories, okay? So it's 50% of your total intake of 1,200 calories can be 600 calories from carbohydrates. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're in the yellow, it's going to be 45%. So let's take that same 1,200 calories times 0.45 that's 540 calories of carbohydrates. We're going to talk about carbohydrates in a second here, like what that looks like too, but calorie wise, 540. If you're in the high sensitivity, if you're in the red, we're going to take that same 1200 calories and we're going to times it by 0 0.40. So 40% of your calories can come from carbohydrates. That's 480 calories of carbohydrates with a 1200 calorie diet. Okay. What kind of carbs? Okay. Let's be real. This doesn't give you permission. If you're low sensitivity, it doesn't give you permission to like eat pizza and pasta and rice galore. What it means is really focus first and foremost. I don't care what it says in this report as people who study this and work with people. Um, this means vegetables <laughs> first and foremost, try to get most of your carbohydrate from vegetables. So we'll talk about fasting here in a little bit, like what, how many hours, like kind of a good range for certain people, how long they should fast. But I really like to have people eat two meals a day. Um, and maybe they're having a small meal in the morning, depending on if um, they can't fast or if they have insulin issues or, you know, glyce, um, uh, hypoglycemia or diabetic issues or something. But for the most part, you want to focus on good, healthy vegetables, not white potatoes, not corn, watch the peas, watch the carrots, um, non-starchy, healthy vegetables. And Look, that's if you want to really, if you're trying to lose weight, lose weight. to maintain, or you, you have more whatever, flexibility, then you can have, you know, some, some legumes and beans, but legumes and beans can one be in and oats and grains. All of those foods can be inflammatory. They can cause gassiness, um, digestive issues. So listen to your body. Um, this is genetic. So if your digestive system is a wreck and you're gassy, you're bloated, you're diarrhea or constipated, you've got an epigenetic issue. Like if you're in the green and you should be able to have 50% of your diet from carbs and you're low sensitivity, but your diet is all mucked up, you got to get that in check. And then initially, once you get that in check, then you can kind of go back into a normal 50% of your diet can be of healthy carbs, but know the difference between healthy carbs. It is not a lot of grains. We are not designed to eat a lot of grains. We're not designed to eat a lot of legumes and beans and stuff like that. So you have some people, if you're very, very healthy, it doesn't bother you, but 
if you're trying to lose weight, those are foods you've got to take out for a while and get your digestive system working better. And then you can, once you do that, you can start a diving into more where you land in your carbohydrates. However, if you're in the red, you really have to watch it even when everything is in check. Okay. So we have lots of people that are high. Is this Marine? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's you. So you're okay. So is anybody here? Everyone's Helen's kind of in the low sensitivity. I, I just have, I have your DNA. On my yeah. Phone. So, so Helen is low sensitivity to carbs. Helen's done our cell detox program. So she got her body reacting better to food and cleaned up. And now she can start bringing in some of those foods, but she's going to pay attention. She's going to let the scale be her accountability partner. She's going to let how she feels be her accountability partner. And if there are certain foods that make her feel icky, she's not going to eat them, even though they're a carb. So we all have foods that we, um, our bodies like better, even if they're all considered healthy, they're not always healthy for everybody. So that's how you would figure out how many carbs you can have. Yes, there's some information here in the blue, uh, but this example on this page here where it's talking about, it's showing like a breakfast one, this is just an example, do not eat like this. (laughs) Breakfast two, do not eat like this. This is just an example. Um, I'm not so much concerned about the glycemic index. I'm more concerned about the quality of the vegetables you're eating. Um, You know, I don't want anybody... um, eating wheat toast for breakfast. Well, and you have to remember that some people are bodybuilders and there's yeah. a variety of people that get these. Some people are gym owners and, mm-hmm. you know, they, they do eat more stuff like that, but for- And they're working out a lot. So their bodies can at least break it down. But for most people, you just, it's using some common sense and focusing on the healthier foods in the category, such as carbs. Okay. Fats. So for me, so I'm medium sensitivity to carbs, but I'm low sensitivity to, to fats. So if I were to choose to do keto, I'd want to choose a healthier version of keto, not eating, you know, lunch meat and cheese, like that's not healthy, but incorporating healthy vegetables. And I mean, I did keto and I had good success on it, but then it came to a point where it did not work for me. And so be very careful if you're doing a keto diet, especially if you have high sensitivity or medium sensitivities to fats, you do not want to do a keto. Paleo is pretty good for everybody. Mediterranean, Mediterranean, but if you're sensitivity, if you're high sensitivity to fats, you got to really watch doing a Mediterranean because it's focusing on, you know, a lot of healthy fats too. So um, you just got to use common sense here. I don't really like to say too much about certain diets because it really has to be tweaked. So for somebody um, who is low sensitivity to fat like me, I'm going to walk through that 1200 calorie diet. So we know what our carbs are. So let's find out what fats are going to be. So for fats, somebody in the low sensitivity can have up to 30% of their fats. So at 12 of their calories. or their calories can be fat. So if we take that 1200 times 0.30, that's 360 calories of fat. Now here's the thing with fat, fat has over double the amount of calories per gram as protein and carbs. So don't think on your plate is truly 30%. It's actually should only be about 15% of your plate because there's nine calories to a gram of fat and there's four calories to a gram of carbs and protein. So it's more than double. So fats, the fats that you want to incorporate in your diet are going to be things like olive oil and your salad dressings or cooking with it, um, healthy nuts, pecans and walnuts, macadamians, kind of watch the, um, uh, what are the cashews? Cashews are actually um, a fruit. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Um, but just kind of watch um, how much you're eating. Now, here's the thing with fats. If you run in, I always ask somebody, do you have your gallbladder? Because the gallbladder is one of those things that most doctors will remove without thinking twice about it. They get a new vehicle if they remove your gallbladder. So <laughs> just being facetious and a little silly, but um, just saying. <laughs> anyway, if, if, yeah, yeah, it's a useless organ. You know, I don't know what God was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, God, I don't know why he gave us gallbladder. Gallbladder is what stores your bile. Okay, so if they've had their gallbladder removed and they're low sensitivity to fat, um, hello, 
they do not have a gallbladder. So they can't be all joyous around fats. They have to, they have to almost treat it as if they're high sensitivity because epigenetically now they did something outside of their DNA to influence now how their genetics are going to respond. So if somebody doesn't have their gallbladder, it doesn't mean they can, you know, do keep, they should not be doing keto, but um, they definitely have to watch their fats. All right, let's go back to percentages now. So on that same 1200 calorie diet, if you're in the green, 300, uh, 30% is 360 calories that you could incorporate into your diet. Now, these are, these are just kind of, um, there are really good numbers to follow for people. And what I would say is a lot of people aren't really big on tracking their food. There's all kinds of free trackers that you can do, but here's the thing you really want to, um, do it for a couple of days. Cause most of us eat the same 25 foods other, unless we go out and we're trying something new, but most of us eat the same 25 foods every single day day or week, right? We go to the grocery store. We know we could probably go in there blindfolded and buy, pick the same foods and not even know where we're at in the grocery store because we are habitual. We buy the same darn things all the time. We like the same vegetables. We like the same fruit. We like the same meats. We like the same junk. We like the same this or that or other. So what you want to do is just get an idea. But if you're really trying to lose weight, I would say you want to count this on a daily basis. And if you're maintaining, maybe you're just every once in a while kind of checking in, making sure that you're staying kind of within these, these numbers. All right. So with, you um, want me to do the math for all of just tell me the yeah. So, um, for, for fats, if you're in the yellow, it's going to be 25%. So you're going to take that say 1200 by times it by 0.25. And then in the red, um, it's only 20%. So you're going to times that number by 0 0.20 to get your calories per day. So just a really quick thing. Everybody talks about like the keto diet is like the buzzword right now. And I, I think the keto diet is good for a lot of people and a lot of reasons. But what's important is one, what Angie said is it, it a healthy keto diet, not just like eating a plate full of bacon and not eating any carbs. That's not a healthy keto diet. But the second thing is anybody will lose weight, a little bit of weight for a little bit of time if you eliminate carbs, but it's not going to be healthy or sustainable if you're a person that needs more carbs. So like she and I did the keto diet. I swear she was probably thinking that I was cheating because you know, like, she's just losing weight. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I can't lose any weight. And have you ever had girlfriends where everybody does a diet and everybody loses weight except that one, it's usually you. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and everybody's probably looking at you like, well, you must be cheating. Like, yeah, okay, you're not, you're doing it. Okay, but you are, but your body might be different. So that's why this stuff is so important. Mm -hmm. So I get mine and I'm high sensitivity to fat. She's low sensitivity to fat. Well, of course she's going to do better on keto. Mm -hmm. Now everybody could lose weight on keto. Yeah. I always did. Yeah. It's just that that's because I was reducing some of the inflammation from all the higher carbs that I was doing when I started keto. But then when your body gets rid of that, it just stops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can all diet, do the same diet, and we'll lose weight for a little bit and then it stalls out. So if you're that's a person right. that stalls out. DNA is really important because you might not be following the diet, right? I do need some more carbs than that. And I do do better if I have some extra carbs. Yep. So, but you know, I didn't like vegetables. So carbs to me were, she does now though, all those bad things. <laughs> so with protein now, it's like, okay, we don't test protein. So how do you figure out your protein? So your, your protein is going to be what's left over. So let's use mine as an example. I'm not going to go through it because this is already getting long. So let's just, let's use mine. I am medium sensitivity to carbs. So I'm at 25% carbs, but I'm low sensitivity to fat with, or I'm sorry, um, I'm 45% um, for my carbohydrates, because I'm medium moderate sensitivity, and I am low sensitivity. So I am 75% between my carbs and my fats, 75% of my diet is going to be carbs and fats, what's left 25%. So I'm going to figure out how much protein I should have based on that. So now I'm going to take that 1200 calories times 0.25. And that'll give me my allowance for my protein. 
So just kind of figure out all you got to do is um, and I'm going to run through these again so you can write them down. So fats, if you're in the green, it's going to be 30%. In the yellow, it's going to be 25%. And in the red, it's going to be 20%. For carbohydrates, if you're in the green, it's going to be 50%. In the yellow, it's 45%. And in the red, 40%. So just take, just take your fats and carb percentages, add those up subtract hundred and that gives you your protein. And then um, times the calorie allowance by that percentage point, whatever, and that'll give you your calories, okay? Makes sense? And then healthy fats on the next page here, you can say, listen, you wanna really focus on the mono and the polyunsaturated fats. We do usually get plenty of omega-6s without even trying. Um, so I don't tell people to focus on those because if you do, then you're probably not gonna get enough omega-3s and those essential fatty acids. So um, that's what that page can tell you. Okay, so a couple of really important things and the rest of them are pretty quick. So stay with us here. Um, body weight, this is um, a great way to even confirm this is, so body weight to me, I always, I was big in fifth grade. I weighed 122 pounds. I was a big girl. My friends all weighed like 80 pounds and I was 122. Like I was a woman. I had breast. I was five foot four and five foot four now. And I was in fifth grade. And so I used to say, I'm just so big boned and I, I'm not. And so here's a good trick. So you take your finger, like it's a gun and you take that finger and then you go right to your wrist and you go around and you should be able to touch. Like I can touch. Big bones. <laughs> I know, look at that. So like I can touch my fingers with the gun. Can't even come close. Then you can go to the next one and then the next one. So if you're like, you can't touch here, you're probably medium or, you know, it's, it's so you're closer to your fingers or that knuckle. You're on the other side of your little knuckle here. So you're just at the base of the hand. And I mean, it's so funny that I used to think I was, so big boned. No, I was yes, a big girl. Big I ate a lot. Um, but so uh, the reason for this is I tell people there's a lot of information on this page, but the key thing with this page is, is somebody designed to be a little bit bigger? Because if you got somebody in the red and they're trying to get to a size four, you know, it might just not be realistic. Their frame is just maybe not genetically designed for that. It doesn't mean they can't be fit and thin, they're just not going to be super, super, super thin. You know, it's kind of like wanting to be three inches taller. Ain't going to happen. Like, you know, you can only, you can only wear <laughs> heels so high. <laughs> anyway, my point is the big thing for this is just to kind of have a, a, a better idea that, because I have people that are very overweight that are in the green and I'm like, you're not designed to be overweight. So let's figure out what's going on. Are you an emotional eater? Um, mm -hmm. What's going on in your life that you know, are you trying, are you protecting yourself? Is, is there something else going on? Because genetically speaking, you are not designed to be heavy. Okay. So, oh yeah. Um, and it, it also, it, you know, if you have an increase, if you're in the red here, you could have a better, I mean, you're just, if you don't have things in check, you could definitely become obese. Like you need to use logic and, and be in check if you're in the red here. Um, weight regain. So for me, this is a big one. I look at this for fasting and Marina and I both were yo-yo dieters. I don't know about you guys, but Marina and I said, if there was a diet, we've been on it. It was mm -hmm. just, we've done it. So, um, the more you diet, the more likelihood of not only losing, but when you regain, regaining a couple pounds more, and then over time, you end up being on the other side of where you want to be and you end up gaining more weight than you end up losing. And you're constantly, you're really, you're hurting your body. Um, I mean, I've been dieting obviously since I was in fifth grade. Um, and it, it's, I really have struggled with my weight on and off. And finally through cell detox, our DNA, knowing how my body is meant to work, I am able to keep everything in check. Um, for almost a year now, I mean, we're just short of a year. I've been able to maintain my weight, which is, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but let's talk about fasting when it comes to weight regain. So if you, a lot of people are like, oh, I could never go without eating in the morning. Well, maybe not, but maybe you can, you just have created habits because we have habits, right? We become very, we're very habitual 
people. So if you are in the um, green, this is a person that really can fast for 16 plus hours on a consistent everyday basis. Maybe you have one day where you decide you're going to, maybe it's Saturday, Sunday, you want to have breakfast um, and you don't fast. But for most people in the green going 16 hours a day. So your feeding window, as I like to call it, your eating window is an eight hour window. Think about it. Eight hours is kind of a lot, right? <laughs> I mean, green, uh, green. So 16 plus hours. If you're in the green for me, I'm in the yellow and I will tell you, I can go 16 hours, but then if I go 16 hours or more and it's time to eat, I am overeating. Mm because I am designed to only fast around 14 to 16 hours. So I have to be careful. Um, this is where I kind of disagree with some of the things they say. I don't think people should eat a bunch of frequently small meals. However, um, if you can work your way, like let's say you get your DNA done and you're in the yellow and you're like, there is no way I could go 14 hours, man, 12 hours max. Well, start there and be consistent and eventually take it a half hour. Go a week now where you're doing 12 and a half hours. And eventually you will get there on a consistent basis. Your body loves consistency. It doesn't like yo-yo dieting. It doesn't like four days on, three days off, because eventually you're going to put on the weight again. You know, how many times it's like, okay, Monday, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're good. Friday night, fish fry, Saturday, there's parties. And Sundays, we're going out for breakfast and church and all birthdays or whatever. Three days off is not going to work on a weekly basis. Like, yes, every once in a while or a vacation here and there. But if you're consistent throughout your life here on forward, your body will respond. But it's when we are consistently inconsistent, the body doesn't like it. So in your, if you're in the yellow, 14 to 16 hours is kind of your time frame. work up to 16. But don't, if you go over that, you're probably going to overeat in the meals that you're going to eat. If you're in the red, this is the person they're genetically speaking, they are not meant to fast long-term. It actually can send a genetic code saying starvation. So whatever went on in your history of your genetics, starvation was a big part of that. So if you see food, think of food, smell food, you know, there's food around, it's that time of the day for you to eat and you don't eat your body when you do eat will store it as fat. Mm -hmm. So you want to be cautious to not exceed kind of that um, 12 to 14 hours. Some people can work their way to 14 hours, but really to go over that on a regular basis. Now, Hey, if you want to do a 24 hour past or, or fast or something like that, that's fine. But consistently speaking, you want to shoot for like 12 to 14 hours of no, nothing but water, coffee, our slim plus does not break a fast, but anything with protein and fat and, um, higher carbs is going to break your fast. So what we know, cause we've tested it is our hydrate doesn't break it. Slim plus doesn't, um, water, tea, coffee does not break it. But when you start throwing in heavy creamers and all of calories, calories and stuff, mm -hmm. anything over like 20 calories can start to work against you. So that goes for all of the, you know, no matter where you are here in the weight regain. So that's kind of a big one with this one that I really overlooked. Um, but when I really started diving into it, it's like, and, and doing it, I was like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Um, appetite. So this is another one where um, there are some people who just can't help it. Um, so Thanksgiving is coming up and I always, no matter if it's summertime, no matter what, I always use Thanksgiving as my example. So Thanksgiving deal uh, meal, I'm going to talk about the person in the green. They're the person that we would say eats like a bird. They're the person who barely puts anything on their plate. They don't even finish it. And they're so full. And you're like, you're picking at their plate because you can't believe they're going to waste that food. Like they're just, they don't have much of an appetite. They have a really quick response from the time food hits their mouth and they start chewing and then it gets into the gut to signal back to the brain that they're eating and they're close to being full. Like it's really quick. It's immediate. The person in the red, <laughs> the far end of it, they're the person who they fill up their plate. They mount their plate with food. And before the bird has even finished half her plate, they're back for seconds and they're shoveling it in 
and they're, they don't even recognize how much they're eating. And then when dessert comes, they haven't even cleaned the dishes off the table and they're like digging in the pie. Like they have no shut off valve. So they never feel full. They never feel satiated. So just if somebody says they're in the red and they're like, oh, well, I hardly eat anything. It's like, well, how was growing up? You know, were you, were you ever told not to overeat? I mean, there's mothers out there who like literally were grooming them for, you know, trophy wives. <laughs> just say it and they might have some Jeez, my mother failed yeah yeah i know right <laughs> Sorry, but there, there, yeah. there there might be well, there might there might be an emotional component that has mm-hmm. triggered something because maybe they have this genetic coding obviously and they never they out ate their brothers and their brothers didn't have this genetic coding and their dad or mom were like uh that is not how young ladies eat that was me i had two brothers and it was like you know, feast or famine, <laughs> you know, you got it. Well, the getting was good. Um, the person in the yellow me, I'm the person, I have a delayed response to eating and triggering being full and satiated. So what do I have to do? I have to take 20 to 30 minutes and eat. When I shovel it in, I am always still hungry. But if I take time to, so the person in the yellow and the person in the red, here are the habits that you want to discuss with them. And some of this is in here, but you want to put the fork down. You want to take a between bites. You want to take a breath between bites. You want to take less food than you typically would want to eat. And then just take your time and chew your food. Those are four things that if you're in the yellow or the red, if you do those four things and test it, this Thanksgiving, test it yourself but do those four things. You will look at your plate and it'll still be half full of food. And you'd be like, I am full. I mean, it's pretty crazy. But then again, if you're in the green and you have a huge appetite again, what is going on emotionally? What is it about the food that you're eating? Like I have a, I just did her review yesterday. She's in the green, but it's only certain foods that she just can't stop. Mm. Potato chips, you know, rich that means salty epigenetically she did that to herself she she it's an emotional response like she has a connection to certain foods that could be triggering so it is it is just being aware of where you are and then what to do about it and factoring in the emotion it's mainly instead of epigenetics is emotional because it's it's occurring outside of your genetic code and it's triggering genetics to respond a certain way but if you are in the green and you do overeat why what is it about food were you the person every time something bad happened to you mama or grandma were like here here maybe you're italian you know and it's like food 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 right so just a good thing to take some awareness to so that helps some of us understand why we can eat bite for bite with our husbands who are six foot tall and almost yeah. 200 pounds. And mine used to always say, how can you eat that much? <laughs> how yeah. can you not? I don't know. What's wrong with you? Well, I, I, no. didn't, I didn't know I was full yet. Right? You know? Yeah. Thanks for making me feel bad. Well, I mean, I would usually bring it up and be like, how can you be full? I'm still eating. And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and now it's just kind of a joke, but I don't, you know, I don't realize I'm full. And then afterwards I'm like, oh, and I'm like, like groaning. And yeah. he's like, yeah, you overdid it. But and that's, brain doesn't yeah. tell and me. so that's the one in the yellow. So the person in the yellow, they're the persons who they take more food than they should. They, they don't do the, the logic stuff of putting the fork down, chewing the food, taking a breath. And then they go, they take a couple bites of dessert. And then in that 20 to 30 minute time frame, they're literally rolling on the floor. Like, oh my God, I literally feel like I'm going to die. And I'm okay. I'm okay when I cook and fix my own plate. But if I go out to eat, or I just <laughs> eat what's on my plate, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm because that's split what meals, me. I should be ask eating. for a to-go box. So you only eat half. All right. Addictive tendencies and impulsive eating. Night. So this is, we're referencing food here, but this is for anything. So it could be, you know, uh, gambling, shopping, OCD, uh, cleanliness. It can be all kinds of things, but basically alcohol. yeah, alcohol, smoking. This is a dopamine. It's a chemical response that your brain is looking for. So for me, I don't have these tendencies. Like I'm one that's like, 
I could drink coffee for three months in a row and be like, one day it's like, eh, I'm just not going to drink coffee anymore. Like, I don't, it's no big deal to me. Like I can, Slim Plus is probably the only thing that I'm addicted to. I probably could live without it, but I'm choosing not to. Um, but really anything, I, I don't have this compulsive, impulsive, addictive tendencies. So but again, you can create it. You absolutely emotional. You can create this. And so this is a great thing. If you have children, like what if you knew you have a child who had some of these tendencies, you might really start paying attention to their friends that they're hanging around. Where are they? And what are they doing? Because the likelihood um, of them having some, maybe, you know, smoking marijuana or doing any of that is a lot more likely if you're not really in control of this child. I'm just saying. So it's a pretty, for that factor as an adult, it's more of a, hmm, well, maybe that's why I'm like that. Now you can start to use logic to work your way out of it. It's like, okay, so I can help it, but what are some things I can do? I'm aware of it. Maybe I just don't be so, you know, crazy about it. Or you find something else that's maybe a healthier thing to switch over. Maybe instead of, you know, um, uh, food, maybe it's, you know, exercise or something, but you even have to be careful with that because you don't want to overdo anything. So it's just really being aware of but that. But it's also good to find out when you thought you had like, oh, I'm addicted to sugar or whatever. And then you get this and you're like, oh, I'm a normal risk. So basically I created that. So it's kind of, um, yeah. empowering to know that if you created it, you can change it. Mm -hmm. uh, bitter taste. If you're a super taster, we have a tendency and we do because uh, everyone I talk to says the same thing. I like flavor in my food. I like salt. I like, uh, like salsa, like ketchup. I I'm, I'm a condiment freak. Like I love that. And obviously if you're not, you're just, this is not so big of a deal, but people who don't like veggies sometimes can be that they have pulled too much bitter out of that. So they have a tendency to want to like season or salt and, um, creams and butters on their, on their vegetables, uh, cholesterol response. Basically, I think everybody pretty much has this, but, um, basically we do all of us respond good to exercise when it comes to cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a bad thing. Every cell in your body, every hormone, we need cholesterol. So taking medications that re basically halt cholesterol production, you need to be very careful of because cholesterol does play a role. Of course we want it in check though. So that mm -hmm. is the conversation with your doctor, uh, inflammation. I have a normal risk, but if you come right out of the chute from your mama and you have an increased risk of inflammation, now think of all the epigenetic factors that can influence that food injuries, not, not getting good sleep, um, poor water, stress. stress, stress is the number one cause of inflammation. Um, I mean, you could be just sitting at home and be super stressed about everything and cause even more inflammation. So if you're already at an increased risk, you got to be aware of that. If you are like me in a normal risk, but all of a sudden you got puffy fingers all the time and your joints hurt and you're swollen, we got to take a step back and look at diet, look at nutrition, your vitamins and all that kind of stuff. This is a big deal. Our post-workout for this is really beneficial. And fish oil, essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids you don't get from, your body doesn't make them, so you do have to take them in as well. So just a note there. Uh, lactose, honestly, I think everybody needs to watch what they're doing when it comes to dairy, um, especially the hormones and all of the chemicals that the, the cows and that are getting these days. Um, one thing about like ID life's, um, whey protein shakes is we don't have lactose or lactose is a sugar and they don't have casein and casein's the protein. And even sometimes it's not even the lactose. That's the problem with digestive issues with people. It's that they can't break down that casein, that protein, and that just wrenches on their gut. But, um, if, if you're like me and you have, you know, basically you're tolerant of dairy, you want to make sure you're doing like organic stuff, um, not overdoing the cheese. And, and if you are lactose intolerant, you'd probably know that. But, um, and some people will say they've known that since they were a child. So you just want to be careful and choose high quality stuff and listen to your body. Um, caffeine, lucky ducky me. I am uh, good. Like caffeine doesn't, I'm the person I could drink a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock at night. I often drink a slim later in the day, but it doesn't bother me. 
other people like Maureen, she can't have it too late in the day or she's up solving the world's problems at, you know, one o'clock in the morning. If she, no, I, I'm, I'm a little sensitive. Oh, you are. Oh, you are. Um, what I just abused it. <laughs> yeah. She'll sometimes do it even later. Yeah. But, so, um, that's why I would have those. We're just always trying to solve the world's problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people are, they can only have like 100 milligrams, which basically would be, you know, a slim plus a day, maybe with a little energy in it. So, you know, you want to kind of stay within reason. Um, the healthier you are, the more your body can metabolize that caffeine. But for some people, it's just really hard on them. So this is just this a is good really note. really eye-opening for some people because they really don't get it. Like mm -hmm. people that can just drink caffeine are like, well, what do you mean you can't have people would say that to me oh i can't have a slim after four yeah. o'clock and i was like what's wrong with or, you i mean <laughs> one o'clock and i'd be one o'clock i can't i shouldn't have one after like six, six. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like what i do a it's only 80 plus and an energy mix i only so. do a third of a pack of energy yeah <laughs> just because <laughs> I choose. Um, so alcohol, no, it's not their fault. So alcohol, this doesn't mean have at it, like go drink. This is that flush. It's your, your, the way your body even alcohol is toxic to the body. I mean, it is what it is. So it's how your body processes that toxic load. Um, so I see people, they'll take like two sips of red wine and they're beat red. Oh, as we get a, we get a finger point over here. <laughs> so, you know, it's just kind of a note of there's probably some other things that your body doesn't necessarily um, process fast either. So, so does that mean that they can get drunk faster? Ah, uh, you can get drunk faster. Absolutely. Yeah. Like one and done should be the rule. You're getting carried, you're getting carried to bed that night. Um, the next section here, we're just going to quickly go through the vitamins, but what I want to say, this doesn't mean you do or don't like, I would say if you come up standard, it doesn't mean you don't need vitamins. Our, our soil that our food is growing in is unbelievably depleted, unbelievably depleted. Um, most of our food is being transported in. And I mean, they spray formaldehyde in the back of these trucks that are bringing refrigerated stuff. So let's be real. We have a high toxic load, even in things that we consider healthy. And with vitamins, it helps our cells eliminate the toxic load better, but also be able to take in nutrients better to create a healthier life. I mean, Maureen and I look so much younger in our fifties than we did in our forties because of the way we like nourish our body with vitamins. It doesn't mean you need to have a crap ton of vitamins, but it does need, uh, it does mean that you do need to make sure the ones that you tend to burn through faster, you definitely want to have, but you also want to have a good baseline of all of these things. Like if your vitamin D levels are normal, we know epigenetically stress will burn through vitamin D really fast. So this is how your body burns through nutrition genetically. We're not talking about stress. Stress is the number one killer. If you don't think your body needs resources when you're stressed, think again, like your brain needs like glucose and nutrients, super, super, like when you're stressed, it's, it's pulling, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul all day, all night. And when it can't rob Peter to pay Paul from this tissue, that organ, this or that, or the other within, you're going to get symptoms, which means you're going to be on medications. And if you're on medications, don't think because you're on a medication that whatever it is goes away. No, it's just suppressed. It's still happening. And it's, it's growing and getting worse and worse and worse. And then one day you're like, you need a new medication because now you have a new symptom because that medication depleted you. So you need to be very aware that when we're talking about this nutrition, we're just talking about how your body basically has an increased need and maybe even burns through maybe certain nutrients faster genetically without all the other stuff. So that's where our ID nutrition comes in. And with, with your kit, you get a coupon for your first box of up to a hundred dollars, you get a coupon. So you can really get a good grip on everything you would need um, to really help nourish your body at a baseline. And then even to address some more important issues as well. Well, and as an add on to that, it also goes the other way. So if you, you know, blood, this isn't blood work. It's not telling you what you're deficient in. It's telling you what genetically you could be. 
And so if you just decide somebody says take vitamin A and you're going to go take a bunch of vitamin A, maybe you shouldn't be taking vitamin A and you just see an ad or you hear something and so you just go take it. So that's why it pairs up really well with our health assessment because that's going to determine based on your symptoms and it's, and it's going to block anything that you shouldn't take based on your, your history and what you eat and all those things. So people that, you know, they get this, it's a guide. It's, it's just a guide. It is not a blood test, but um, you shouldn't be taking a bunch of vitamins that you don't need either. You can, and we'll maybe do a separate video on, um, walking through, like I have a woman who's been breastfeeding and you wouldn't believe what's blocked from her assessment. So maybe we'll do that too. We'll do a separate one. Cause this is getting kind of long. So we apologize, but we want to make sure we're covering the basis. So vitamin a for me, I'm standard, but however, if I had an increased requirement, I could also look down here and see what foods that fit into my diet that are good for me, that I would maybe want to incorporate maybe, you know, several times a week, or maybe even every day, maybe I want to add some kale or hmm, sweet potatoes. I could do that every day, but, um, just to make sure that I am getting, um, even just vitamin A, just so I'm getting it, even though I have standard requirements, it doesn't mean I don't need it. Vitamin D, I have a slightly reduced levels. And I will tell you, Maureen and I have done so many blood panels and blood work is a moment in time. It's not, ever, it's not like, you know, people who get blood work once a year and are basing their health off of that once a year lab. It's not necessarily a true picture of your health because the next day you, you something could totally change. So, um, but it is a good idea to see kind of where you're at. We always like people to get their new, um, their blood work done when they're in their like normal state of living and being, you know, don't go on vacation and come back and go get your blood work. Cause you might've been drinking, you were flying, you know, it's like things are kind of crazy in your body and your body's starting to kind of react and come back to a normal place. So you want to wait a few days and let your body kind of get acclimated back to what is normal for you. Then go get blood work. But so for vitamin D, I have I have increased needs for it and I can look at these foods, but I also can do the easy thing and take tiny little pills. And, you know, I think my levels are around 70, which they should be between 70 and 90 is really where we like to see them. And most people we see, <laughs> even when we look at their DNA and they have, you know, normal, they should have normal levels. They're in their twenties. Maybe we even have some that are less. So um, I think everybody, especially if you're in the Midwest, definitely need um, increased vitamin D. Vitamin E, I have standard requirements. Again, I can look at food, um, B6. So B6, I have an increased need. And so B6 has an influence on B12 and even folate. And it's with our mood and um, melatonin. So knowing that I have an increased requirement for B6, I just add in my ID nutrition, I take the B complex because I'm getting all my Bs. They're all working together. There's a good amount of everything I need. And it's the methylated version of the folate and the methylcobalamin. So it's even easily, more easily um, absorbed at a cellular level. But B6, without it, I could struggle with other things like... Um, sleep and um just mood nobody wants to see angie grabby so um and then here's some foods that you can look at as well too <laughs> like a sailor when i <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> uh, my daughter says i know where willie gets his temper from i'm like do you <laughs> um folate so i have a standard requirement folate's a big thing um we'll be testing both sides we have the 1298 gene and the 677 gene that we'll be testing. But um, for folate, if there's an issue with folate, you could also have an issue with the MTHFR mutation, which has, it sets you up for very um, possible um, inability to process toxins and also um, just other nutrients, especially your B vitamins, um, infertility, um, mm -hmm. uh, miscarriages, you're if you're taking meds, uh, it's, this is a big one. So if you come in here and you have increased requirements for B9, your folate, um, you definitely want to be taking uh, methylfolate, 5-methylfolate, the methylated version, so that it actually does work and get into the body. Don't just take folic acid or folate. It'd be like eating a rock and especially um, expecting your body to break it down. Um, 
V12, I do have an increased requirement. I do like a, I take B uh, vitamins um, because of this. Um, and it really does help me sustain my energy levels um, almost to a point where it's like, I have to go to bed now. Like I've worked till 10 o'clock at night and I got up and started working at nine. So um, it, it really helps with my, my focus, my energy levels. And then this last page here, um, this basically everything that we just went through to how we got to see how my genetics actually express themselves, it's color coded. So where you see green, you can see, um, you can look for in like, um, let's just go like to here. When you go into these orange boxes, the genes they tested, you can go into, you know, a gene that was tested and then fall back into this last page here and see how it, by the, just match up the colors and it kind of talks about what it is. But honestly, don't get hung up on this page. And I always tell people don't get hung up on this page because it, it's a lot. And genetics are forever, they're changing and we're learning more about what these, these genetic gene, these genes do. So as we learn more, we'll report more, but this is just a great start for you to get started. Um, basically, if the two letters don't match up, you have some sort of a variant yeah. in that genetic SNP. Yep. And it's all discussed in this. So that's just kind of the key. But. And this glycemic load chart, this is the part I never eat. I just don't even go over anybody. I just tell people, listen, these are just foods. It talks about your glycemic index and your glycemic load with, this is the most popular foods. This is the sad diet. This is the standard American diet, which is really scary. Like you go into breakfast this is why I don't, I tell people, listen, I, and I use this as an example. It's like, for instance, if you go to breakfast, listen, what are, if you're eating any of these things, but eggs, you shouldn't be eating them. But unfortunately the standard American diet, this is what people are eating. So you can see what the glycemic load is. Like you look at an egg, the glycemic index is zero and the glycemic load is zero, zero. <laughs> okay. So now you go to look at this. Lucky Charms, the glycemic index is 66 and the load is like 19. So don't get hung up on these foods. It doesn't mean you should eat these foods. What it means is this is a standard American diet and it's giving you um, for the most popular foods, it's actually giving you the, the, um, in, the um, what do you want to call it? Not the ingredients, but the um, nutritional facts. Well, and it, it's just eye opening. I mean, yeah. nobody's saying that Angie and I never have anything bad. I mean, if you want to call food good or bad, it's not like we never have a piece of holy toast. But what we're saying is, if you want to really. look through like the high glycemic or the glycemic yeah. load, you'll see. Choose and you, well. You can kind of get a, a better idea mm -hmm. of, oh wow, I had no idea that. Yeah, like bakery items. Bad. So, you know, I always go glycemic load over glycemic index. And mm -hmm. so like the lowest here is a flour tortilla. That's the lowest than a whole wheat bread. But you also, you got to kind of look at the, you know, this isn't every, if you bend on the bread aisle, there's like 300 brands of bread. Yeah, these, are, <laughs> these are just to give you ideas. Yeah. So anyway, you guys, thank you very much. We're gonna, um, we've got... Oh, we have, this is a diet. It's a food list, food list here, a couple key recipes, and then an agenda on how to utilize some of our favorite ID Life products that we use in clinic. Um, so if, if you're interested in that, why don't you go ahead and um, reach out to Marine or I, and we'll make sure we email that to you. So, all right, I'm going to stop this recording and hopefully, and... Go from there. You guys have a great day. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yes.